so happy to be here tonight, and I just want to give a warm welcome to all you New Jersey trout anglers out there. And uh, it's laying down. The wind has been really brutal today, and as my friend George would say, yeah, it's laying down. It's laying down trees and small houses. So um, we're just glad to have internet tonight. Uh, before I get started, um, I'll get you to my homepage here, but uh, my presentation is on New Jersey trout fishing, terrain, tactics, and techniques. But I want to uh, send a special thank you to Director Dave Golden for navigating the Division of Fish and Wildlife through this pandemic. Also, our Bureau Chief of Information and Education, Al Ivany, uh, Supervising Biologist Linda DiPiano. They're so instrumental in uh, keeping education and outreach going, um, as well as uh, Senior Biologist Jessica Griglack, who many of you know from not only PQuest, from her work with Trout in the Classroom, and uh, Principal Biologist Karen Byrne, who many of you may have interacted with or met out at Sedge Island on one of her uh, programs. She does a lot of great programs there. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank Paul Tarlow, uh, Senior Biologist Paul Tarlow, who runs the website. And of course, our IT GIS guru, George Mariello, for uh, setting all this up. So. Um, without further ado, welcome, and uh, let's, take a, let's take a few moments here and look over um, how I got here. Why am I such a trout nut? Why am I like impassioned with this desire to go trout fishing all the time? When I was uh, four years old, five years old, I had an older brother, Joey, and he would take me out to uh, catch night crawlers, and then we would go to the south branch of the Raritan River, and we would drown worms. We would pick up my, my best friend, Brad, and we would um, fish from like 6 a.m. until 9, 10 o'clock in the morning and come back with trout and pan fish. And uh, I really, uh, it became so all encompassing. It was all I could think of when I was a young man. Um, from there, I started reading ravenously on the subject. Uh, books like uh, The Complete Angler by Isaac Walton or um, Norman MacLean, A River Runs Through It. Just tremendous uh, information in some of these books. But um, it really was a passion right from the get-go. Uh, also, uh, Les Shannon of Shannon's Fly and Tackle Shop kind of took me under his wing. Uh, there's a little breakfast nook down the road called Gronsky's, where Mr. Gronsky and Mr. Shannon would sit and talk about trout fishing. And I was this young man, and I was like a fly on the wall. I'd be listening and wanting to hear where they're fishing, what they're doing, and how they're going about it. And to kind of uh, further that, uh, Jim Holland, who, who took over the, the, the business, um, offered me a chance to become a, a guide. So now I can teach at PQuest. I also uh, can, can guide out on the river. So th those people were very instrumental. And uh, of course, uh, the chapters of Trout Unlimited also pushing their um, legislation and helping uh, preserve clean, cold water are certainly important. So, but without further ado, let's get on the road and uh, I know there's spring turkeys to go after, stripers in the bay, you've got perch and crappies on the bite, but when April rolls around, all I can think about is trout. So I wanted to uh, come to my first uh, set of teas. So uh, before I tee it off, I just wanna uh, start with a quotation. Um, trout fishing does have its social aspects. On some of our crowded streams, it can get too social, but essentially it's a solitary, contemplative sport. People are left alone with themselves in beautiful surroundings to try to accomplish something that seems to have genuine value. I didn't say that. John Gierach, who wrote an, uh, Anatomy of a Trout Bum, one of the great uh, outdoor writers in the vein of a Pat McManus, uh, came up with that quotation. And that is why I trout fish, not to catch my limit and head back home as soon as possible, because it gets me out thinking and it helps with my day-to-day -day, uh, thinking and life. In New Jersey, we have three kinds of trout. And of course, many of you know uh, these by heart, the brook, brown, and rainbow trout. You'll see this fish here is a brook trout that uh, was stocked many years ago by the Division of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, this trout in the center is a brown trout. That happens to be wild. The brook trout are our native fish to New Jersey. They are actually a char and are our one true native trout. Browns came from Germany and Loch Leven in Scotland. And then of course, you're all familiar with the rainbow trout. And that's the one that we stock at Pequest. They do produce in the wild, but we do supplement that with an aggressive 
uh, stocking program. And I know many of you are, want to know, when are the Browns coming back? And that question will be answered. We are um, working hard and, and getting the things in place needed to hopefully one day reintroduce Browns. Another question I get at PeakQuest when I'm doing programs and I'm teaching is what is wrong with the trout's mouth? And this ugly warrior down here is a male rainbow trout, which has a kipe on its jaw. And the kipe is a spawning uh, characteristic that a trout gets when it is trying to, one, seduce a mate, and also two, fight other trout. So those are the main types of trout. And then and also a frequently asked question there is that, what is wrong with that trout's jaw? And that is a kiped rainbow trout, a male of that species. Okay. Here. okay. Can you all still see me here? Good. Uh, important stocking updates. Uh, a total of 50,000 trout will be distributed in uh, four weeks during the preseason. Uh, that began March 15th due to the pandemic instead of March 22nd. Uh, the waters are now closed to trout fishing. Um, that began March 15th and will lead up to a catch and release season on April 1st. Uh, the historic opening day of trout season is April 10th, and that has a, a daily limit of six trout at nine inches. Uh, no bo bonus broodstock lakes will be uh, stocked this year. And contrary to the seasons past, there'll be no in-season water body closures. So if your lake or pond or river gets stocked on a Friday, you no longer have to wait until 5 p.m. to fish that day. Uh, the remaining 70,000 trout are going to be stocked uh, during a one-week period in May. So those are important updates. Uh, April 1st, uh, we'll start a catch and release season. We're all looking forward to that, really um, chomping at the bit to wet a line. Now, many people will say, hey, Chris, where's the best place to fish? And I'll often say, well, wherever you can. But one of the things that we do on our website is we have a page dedicated to places to fish. That we have one for rivers and streams, and we also have one for ponds and lakes. And it goes county by county. And on that spring stocking page, there are also directions to access points where you can fish and where trout will be stocked. So this is a tremendous, tremendous uh, resource right here. And uh, I want you to e explore that and have some fun with that by looking at your county or perhaps a favorite river, pond, or stream. Um, spots are uh, a well-kept secret in some fishing communities and coaxing, just posting on an internet chat forum, hey, where's the best spot, might get you some uh, mixed answers. Let's start with uh, another T, and that's the terrain. Um, these are the big names in the North Jersey Highlands. These are the rivers like the Pequest, the Musconetcong, the South Branch, the pollen skill, the big flat brook, these are amply stocked both in the spring and in the fall, but they also are trout production waters where there is natural spawning taking place. For instance, on the Musconetcong or the South Branch or the Flat Brook, it is not uncommon to catch a wild brown or a wild brook trout. Um, wild browns, there's uh, you're allowed two in your bag limit in the conservation zone. Any brook trout, and we'll talk about that later, have to be released. But for true enjoyment, there's nothing like feeling the river going through your legs and casting and mending your line and, and working one of the North Jersey rivers. So uh, trout fishing in New Jersey uh, starts here, and, and that's the, the, the place to be uh, come April 1st. It's not to say that there aren't opportunities in central Jersey. Uh, the Toms, the Matita Comp. The lower Raritan River has some beautiful fish, even some holdovers, and the Manasquan. There's Philip Gentile right there releasing a, a, a nice rainbow uh, on his waters. Now, when you get to South Jersey, uh, you're look, looking at a pineland habitat, and some of those tannins build up in the water, 
meaning the water becomes darker, tea colored, and it's not as suitable in terms of dissolved oxygen and trout habitat. So places like the Rancocas Creek, the Cohansi River, the Maurice, the Mullica, they're not trout production, but there is a very good put and take fishery. And again, you can consult the uh, stocking charts to see what rivers and what areas of those rivers uh, will be stocked. So not typical trout waters, but heck, if this is right near your house and you know they put fish in, uh, you can go out and have a great time and, and uh, spend it close to home, even uh, a quick after work sojourn. Now, a lot of people when I'm guiding will, will say, Chris, how, how do I fish moving water? And uh, one of the main tools that I use is this US Geological Service, this river data in real time. It's very important because if I were to want to go fishing yesterday after all of that rain, and I went to say the Ken Lockwood Gorge, which is open or the, the TCA at Point Mountain or the TCA at the Toms, which are open during closures, um, I would look at my phone and check the river to see how high it is. And yesterday I saw the Muskinetcong was over a thousand at one point. The South Branch had come down to 500 cubic feet per second. And you'll see on this graph how a rain event right here will spike the river all the way up. And when you have a nice level flow back down here, that makes for ideal trout conditions. Good, clean current, it's not too fast. Uh, you're able to wade safely and it makes trout fishing not only more productive, but more enjoyable. <clears throat> These river data sites, many of them, not all of them, but many of them do have water temperature gauges. Now, why is water temperature important with trout? They are highly uh, sensitive to thermal shock. Um, their ideal temperatures are in the 45 to 65 degree range. Um, once that river, pond, lake, or stream starts to get around that 70 degree mark, you may want to start fishing for something else. If it reaches 75 degrees, that is absolutely fatal. These are trout that were released by unknowing anglers upstream of me who thought that just because the fish swam away, that they survived. The lactic acid builds up in them after a lengthy fight. They swim away and quickly go belly up because they can't uh, re-acclimatize. Re they can't get used to the, to the stream, that high temperature. So many of us will carry a stream thermometer right in our pack, and that's a good tool to have. But 70 degrees, you may wanna fish in the early morning or in the evening. It's not to say there wouldn't be some great trout activity, because uh, there are variations in temperature uh, during the course of a, a late spring or early summer or early fall day. In terms of reading the water, here's another T, thalweg. What is a thalweg? Um, it's actually the main part of the river channel where it is the deepest. So right here on this section of stream, you can see the thalweg is going up against this down tree. This is the ball of a tree. And here the current is moving and the water is deepest right into the thalweg. Now, how do I know that? Because I constantly wear my polarized sunglasses. I wear them on overcast days. I wear them into the office sometimes to the dismay of my coworkers. But these are, a, these are just as important as a rod, reel, line, lure, and tackle. Um, a good pair of polarized sunglasses will help you identify the thalweg, and it'll also help you identify where you're going to be putting your feet in the water. You can be walking along and you don't see a rock, and the next thing you know, um, you're going swimming in 55-degree spring water. So polarized sunglasses are key. And I, I've had many an occasion where a client will come out of the truck and they'll walk down with me and we'll start to fish the first hole and I'm like, where are your glasses? And they're like, oh, they're in the truck. I don't need them. And they sheepishly walk back to the truck and get them, but a valuable tool. 
It also uh, will tell you uh, what side of the river you want to fish. I definitely would want to fish on this near side because the Thalweg is running here. So I can identify that with my optics. Standing water is a very popular place to fish. We've got lakes, ponds, rivers, all sorts of trout producing and trout holding impoundments. Um, places like Round Valley, Merrill Creek, Tilcon, Aeroflex, uh, Clinton Reservoir, Weiweyanda, Shepherd Lake, and White Lake up north, not to mention the countless ponds and lakes uh, in central and south Jersey. This is a beautiful sunset at Round Valley uh, with a nice, nice uh, rainbow trout right there. But fishing standing water is totally different than fishing moving water. So let's talk about that first. The tackle is different. I'm going to use a longer rod when I'm fishing standing water. I want to get a nice far cast at times. The fish might not be hugging the bank. They might be out in the, the deeper area. Um, a strike guard, that would be something like a, a clip, which allows the line to come out of the reel on a free spool. This uh, reel right here happens to be a bait runner, which has a lever on the back and you can open it. Um, trout are very sensitive feeders. If they feel weight or drag or something, they'll immediately eject the offering. Um, rod holders for the bank, uh, a fork stick will always do. I mean, who didn't start out with a, a rod in a fork stick on the riverbank? I still love to do that. Um, tension floats, uh, to keep the tension on the line will oftentimes hang a little float or at night, a lighted film canister, a clear film canister to kind of provide a little bit of tension on the line. We'll affix light sticks to the tip of the rod. Uh, if bait is not your uh, thing, you can also bring along some spinners. But if you are using bait, um, you want something that floats up off the surface, like off, off the bottom rather. You want a, a, a mealworm and a marshmallow. So a sinker, a leader, a mealworm or a night crawler, and then a marshmallow and a piece of power bait. Now, why that? Because the trout are cruising these places. They're not sitting in the current like a trout in a river would be. They're constantly on the move. In fact, in Round Valley, they search the shoreline for a uh, stream that doesn't exist in order to spawn. And that power bait or that marshmallow floats it up off the bottom right into their line of vision and they take it. This is another way to present a bait into the middle or lower water column is through the use of a slip bobber rig. And that has a knot affixed on the line that slides down through the bobber and jams at a certain depth. And that is a highly effective way uh, for taking trout in still water. Um, we've also experimented and had good luck with floating jig heads. It's a, a type of lure, a jig, which is usually lead. But in this case, it has a, a balsa float on the jig head to float the, the shiner or the mealworm or a piece of uh, night crawler up off the bottom. So if you're fishing still water tackle, keep these things in mind and it'll make you a more effective and, and better angler uh, come this spring when trout season opens. Ah, trout from a boat. You can really go down the rabbit hole with this one. Um, people will go very deep into the weeds trolling for trout and I've succumbed to it. I enjoy it. Um, many of the people that I fish with don't enjoy it as much as I do, but you're using a lot of planer boards, lead core, down riggers, and you're trolling. This happens to be uh, Danny Kay with a giant 20-pound uh, lake trout taken out around Valley on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, this is my nephew with a, a rainbow trout. Um, the rainbow trout in these lakes will be found from the surface of the water. They could be feeding on insects on the surface or minnows just under the surface down to the thermocline. And the thermocline is an area of water where there is a vast temperature change. So from the surface at 80 degrees to the thermocline at Round Valley, it might be 55 degrees and there will be a, a temperature break. And with a good quality sonar unit, you'll actually be able to read that thermocline. Lake trout, in most cases, they'll be from the thermocline to the bottom. And our newly introduced landlocked salmon uh, at Tilcon and Aeroflex and Weiweyanda, these are, are hugely popular fish. Um, people were ice fishing them this winter and catching landlocked salmon. They too like that surface to the thermocline. I know a lot of people ice fishing had a lot of luck jigging just below the ice. Now think about trolling, 
just below the water surface. That's where you find those landlocked salmon and rainbow trout. But uh, trolling for trout, it's something adopted from the Great Lakes region where it is wildly popular. There are many charter uh, businesses and services in the Great Lakes region that cater to uh, trout sa and salmon trolling. Spinning for trout on moving water. Now this is the this is the bread and butter. We're right in the creel and in the wheelhouse here because many of you, most of you, are going to be using a light spinning rod right here, like Colonel Schultz. He's got this spinning rod. He's got his polarized eyewear. Here's his son Isaac. He's got a, a nice trout that he caught on a spinning rod. So what I recommend, if you're new to it, you're just going out this year, or even if you're a seasoned pro, is a, a, a rod and reel that's five and a half to six and a half foot long. It's an ultralight rod, um, very uh, fast action or slow action, depending on how you like it. I prefer a slow action, like a fiberglass rod, but many people like fast action graphite rods. With that, rod and reel combination, you'll be using line that is in the four to six pound test area. And I like monofilament. A lot of people um, are using braid and it is great for a lot of applications. When I fluke or if I go bottom fishing or deep wreck fishing, um, braid is great. But the first time I ever tried braid on an ultralight spinning rod for trout, I made six casts with a spinner and it became so tangled it tends to hold the memory where monofilament is a little more forgiving. Other equipment, things that you'll need for fishing moving water are waders. Uh, the safest are chest waders with a wading belt around your waist to prevent water from getting down. You'll have suspenders and they are sold either with the, the boots built in or you can get stocking foot waders with a neoprene sock and then you buy the boots separately. I prefer that later option. It's like wearing a, a Wellington versus an athletic shoe. That um, stocking foot and wading boot setup uh, is really comfortable and it provides you with good traction when you're walking through the water. Um, we recommend still felt soles. A lot of people will say, but what about Didymo, rock snot? I mean, felt will transmit zebra mussels and other pathogens. There has uh, been no link in New Jersey to uh, Didymo or anything being brought in on, on felt sold waders. Um, you can clean them, disinfect them with a little light bleach solution if you're so concerned. Um, but felt soles will give you a very good grip on the bottom of the rocks. There are places that I fish where it is extremely slippery. Think of uh, the Salmon River or Ken Lockwood Gorge where it's very shady and there's a moss that grows on the rocks. It's very slippery. Um, also, a vest. People like to have a vest to keep their equipment in. I like a chest pack. And of course, your polarized sunglasses, which are uh, very important. Um, dry socks, nice warm socks. It's gonna be cold when you go out. Uh, hopefully, um, the water stays nice and chilly into July and we stay fishing. But most of the time, when you're trout fishing, it's gonna be a little chilly. So. Uh, warm socks with your pants tucked into the uh, socks. It looks kind of funny, but that'll save you the trouble of when you put your waders on having your pant leg right up to your knee and having your bare skin exposed to the cold water. You can be as simple as complex as you want with uh, spinning for trout. I mean, it's how we started when my brother Joe took me. We had spinning rods and uh, uh, Hill Brothers can and night crawlers which we got off the road and, and at night when the, it was raining. But um, you can use lures, you can catch a release. It, it really is the best way to open the door to, to trout fishing. When you look at baits, you'll go to the tackle shop and you'll have to visit there after purchasing your license and your trout stamp. And you'll see that uh, there are all sorts of baits for trout. Here you have preserved emerald shiners that have been put in formaldehyde and salted. These are great baits for brown trout. Um, the rainbow trout uh, will hit them. They, they don't prefer them as much as the browns. Um, here you have a little dace or fathead minnow, uh, great for browns. Um, rosy reds are another type of fathead minnow that they've actually bred a red color into them. 
but many of you will opt for the traditional baits of night crawlers, and then you have a mealworm here, and then butter worms. Uh, all great baits. Um, some people will use corn, and others will use uh, synthetic baits. There's some great synthetic baits. Now be careful if you're fishing in a uh, trout conservation area that says no bait, no uh, live bait, no bait scent, artificial lures only. These are considered bait. And you have gulp products, which are a soft plastic. You have the good old fashioned Mike salmon eggs there or the, the Atlas brand of salmon eggs that have been around for a long time. And of course, the ubiquitous power bait, which is uh, <laughs> talks of it were being outlawed in California. But the best uh, way to fish these is with as little weight as possible, maybe a little tiny egg sinker if you're fishing standing water or a split shot or two pinched above a size 10 to six bait holder hook. And that would have slices in the shank to hold the bait onto the hook. Uh, trout are notorious for being able to um, take a worm or a, a power bait or something um, right off a hook. And as people that teach at the pond at Pequos know, they get really smart very fast. Now on April 1st, the trout season is gonna open for, art of, uh, for catch and release. And a lot of us that are conservationists that do a lot of trout fishing would prefer, we're not mandating it, but we would prefer that people use uh, lures. Why? because the trout is less likely to fully ingest a lure. Um, it's less likely to get caught in a sensitive area. Um, you can pinch the barbs on those lures down, but spinners, a, a rotating clevis with a spinner blade and a, perhaps a, a piece of squirrel tail, like the good old fashioned MEPS or the blue fox or the CP swing or the Joe's fly spinner, really light spinner. That has a rear treble hook that's really small. And I found that that is best snipped off or, or at least um, one or two of the uh, hook shanks uh, cut off of the Joe's flies. Um, spoons like this one will come into play, especially for long cast situations. Uh, the little Clio, the Phoebe, the Castmaster are all amazing trout producers in the spring. Um, plug fishermen. I know a lot of great trout fishermen that use plugs and they are, uh, exceptional trout getters. Look at this one. It's even uh, fashioned to look like a baby brown trout. That's a small Rapala, uh, Yozuri pin minnows, uh, and these little tiny peanut plugs are awesome lures too to use um, when spinning for trout. You can also go the route of a jig or a trout magnet, which is like a little uh, soft plastic tail with a jig head. Um, they, you can also have a jig that's made of a, a feather called marabou, or in this photo right here is a, a, a kind of a new lure that's caught on, um, the squirmy worm. And the squirmy worm is a rubber material. It's not impregnated with any bait scent, so it is considered a lure. Um, fly fishermen can use that lure. Uh, center pin fishermen use that lure, and center pinning is sort of a hybrid between fly fishing and spinning. Um, and it's very popular up in the Great Lakes. And of course, spin fishermen can fish this with a, a little bit of weight or even below a float with a little bit of weight. But this is a, a, a deadly lure to, to, to go to in my fly box when all else fails. And sometimes I need to throw the kitchen sink at them. Ah, fly fishing. This is definitely... Uh, do you have a few hours? Um, no, we, we'll get right to it. We won't go down the rabbit hole. But uh, in terms of fly fishing, it, it is my true love. It's something that I, I live and breathe every day. And for a rod and reel, uh, a four to five weight rod between seven and a half to nine and a half feet long is ideal um, with a floating line. Uh, the fly line floats. It has weight to it. Unlike spin fishing in fly fishing, you're casting the weight of the line. So you'll see people um, waving the rods back and forth as if they're uh, uh, summoning some spirits. But what they're doing is they're 
airing out the fly or preparing a false cast. So the fly line is what carries the lure to the target, to the fish. Here on the right, you'll see uh, a selection of leaders. This is uh, what goes on the end of the fly line because the fly line is thick right here and the leader is clear, monofilament. And for that added advantage, sometimes we go to the fluorocarbon. Now fluorocarbon has the same refractive index as water. Um, it's got good abrasion resistance. And for the little tippet, which is that last piece of monofilament before you tie on the fly, fluorocarbon gets the nod for me. Uh, using an improved clinch knot, a Davy knot, a Palomar knot, all good knots with fluorocarbon. So these are the, the things that you'll need to get started fly fishing. It doesn't cost a lot of money. People will try to, to scare you away and say, well, fly fishing is only for the elitist. There are kits out there for under $200 so that you can get started easily in fly fishing. I, I believe I started with a Cortland kit from a, a, a local tackle shop. And I, I probably back in 1982, probably spent about like uh, $65, maybe $50 for it. So um, don't get scared that fly fishing is for the elite. Uh, you can get set up very quickly. Where it can get really down the rabbit hole is when it comes to the flies that we use. If you walk into a fly shop, you will literally see hundreds and hundreds of flies. I mean, I, I tie them here at my desk. Each one is designed to mimic and imitate a certain thing. So you have nymphs. Well, what is a nymph? A nymph is a subsurface insect. It's a macro invertebrate. It is when you lift rocks and you look under the logs and the debris in the river or pond, you will inevitably see life like this stonefly right here. This is a pumpkin midge. It's a high visibility nymph. It sinks where trout take them below the surface. You can also use a streamer. A streamer is a fly that is cast out and retrieved with a zigzag or stop and go motion. And it's meant to imitate a minnow or a crawfish, or in this case, one of my favorite little river critters, the uh, Johnny darter, not the tessellated, but that would be the Johnny. Uh, darters live amongst the rocks, uh, as do sculpins and mad toms, and big trout love to feed on these big juicy morsels. Um, oftentimes, though, you'll see insects hatching when you're down at the water's edge, and those are emergers, or flies that are hatching. You'll see this fly is uh, coming out of its exoskeleton. It was a former macroinvertebrate. It has risen up to the water's surface or crawled out onto a rock. It's shedding its exoskeleton, drying its wings, and flying away. These are emerger flies. They are fished under the surface of the water. But trout will absolutely hammer emergers. At times, you'll find that uh, elephants will, in fact, eat peanuts. Uh, some of the largest trout I've ever taken, in fact, the largest wild brown trout I've ever taken, uh, came on a size 18 fly. This is a size 20. So if you can imagine that, it's about the size of a comma on a, on a printed page. I fish that on very light line and I use uh, some magnifying lenses to be able to see a fly that small and be able to put that onto the end of my line. And uh, these magnifying lenses, once I hit the age of 40, these magnifying lenses have been an absolute savior when it comes to tying small flies. Midges like trichos and uh, little olives will come out and the trout will be feeding and whatever you throw at them, you can't get them to bite. And sometimes you just have to go smaller and lighter. The last and perhaps the favorite type of fly fishing done by uh, anglers is the dry fly. I mean, the hatch, it's perfect. You get down to the river in the evening, at six o'clock, nothing is happening. By seven o'clock, you start to see the first flies hitting the air. And, and by 7.30, the fish are splashing the water all around you. Um, this is a sulfur mayfly right here. You see the three tails. Here is the actual uh, exoskeleton that it, it climbed out of and it's now drying off. And uh, these are dry flies. This happens to be a spinner, which imitates a dry fly or a mayfly that is hatched 
flown into the air, mated, and then fallen to the water surface with its wings out to the side like an aeroplane. There are times when trout will only hit a fly that is fished like this with a spinner tackle. It's incredible how they can be very selective. But again, that's go, really going down the rabbit hole uh, of fly fishing. Most of us are going to be nymphing. Um, we're going to be drifting our bait and fly and lure uh, upstream. We start our cast angling it upstream, and we mend the line by throwing a loop of line above the fly and above the indicator. Uh, this happens to be an indicator right here. This is a, a float, which is a point of reference for fly fishermen. And it will uh, uh, provide a sight for you to see if you do get a strike. And it'll allow you to make little changes in the speed of the current. So you'll be nymphing upstream and mending as it goes downstream. Uh, the angle of the rod is very important. It's called angling for a reason. People that sit back with their rod kind of tilted up to the sky um, don't, don't catch as many fish as those who are holding the rod in line uh, parallel to the river and really uh, fishing and, and paying acute attention to their offering. Um, it puts a little bit of pressure on your lower back when you do that. And in time, uh, the first time out, you might get really sore from fishing that way. But the angle of the line is imperative in getting this. And this is important for all of trout fishing, a drag-free drift. If you're fishing current, you want that lure, bait, fly, spinner, or something moving along naturally with the current. Release and photos. So we are catching our trout. We've got our trout and, and we're now gonna be uh, releasing it or creeling it, but uh, we pre prefer to release. I release a lot of my trout. Um, we do so at the pond, we do so um, in the river. It's purely your uh, benefit or wh whatever you would like to do in terms of releasing your fish. But um, this is a release net. And a release net is also a mandatory, or what I think is a mandatory tool. Uh, the rubber coating on the net preserves the fish's slime coat and allows for that fish to be released quickly into the water. Um, this is kind of a no-no up here where you see this trout kind of on the bank. He's kind of, that ra big rainbow is kind of in the net. It's kind of not, it, it, it's okay. And then this brown trout, nice in the net, uh, in that nice release bag. Um, if at all possible, I know uh, we try to preach, leave it in the water, leave it in the water. I mean, how, how would you feel if you were brought underwater for three or four minutes and then released? And lastly, no shake and bake. <laughs> shake and bake means you drag the trout up onto the rocks, allow it to flop around for five or six minutes, hold it for three or four minutes while you get a picture and then release it. It's covered in dust. It's covered in dirt. It's shaked and baked all over the riverbank, and that is a fish that is going to get sick or succumb or, or die. So uh, keep those things in mind. A quick release uh, after a photo. You can see here um, Tara, Tara Bogan has her uh, thing open here, right? So she had her camera right in there in her waterproof pocket. So if she handed it to me, I took the picture. Because if you don't do it right, the internet police will come and find you. The internet police, and we love to post our pictures online at Facebook and Instagram. These are great sources of information. They're great sources, but um, for the newcomer, if you post a picture and somebody jumps all over you because you didn't do something right, I'll save you that embarrassment. Um, Steve right here is doing a fairly good job. He's got the release net. He brought it up out of the water. Um, Kelly right here has got his finger kind of close to the gills, but he's okay on this big wild brownie. But this is an absolute no-no in the bottom right. This angler has the fish held by the lower jaw as if this trout was a bass. And not only do trout have sharp teeth, but you can be harming the jaw structure here, harming the gills. And no holding the trout with your finger under the gills if you plan on releasing it. So just be aware. Uh, of those things, if you're going to post, people are very critical, especially in this day and age of social media. Trout management. I love this part because th this is what, what we do here at the division. This is how um, we ensure that 
little wild rainbows like this have a, have a place to spawn or little wild brown trout like this have uh, tiny rivulets where they can be found. Um, your TCAs, your trout conservation areas, seasonal trout conservation areas, trophy trout lakes, they all have special regulations. And it's imperative that you consult the Freshwater Fishing Digest um, before you fish these waters. Um, for instance, the brook trout conservation zone that I mentioned um, exists in northern and northwest New Jersey. Any brook trout, there are, are native fish, um, they are wild and they need to be released immediately. Um, any brown trout that you happen to catch and you want to add them to your limit of six trout, um, you are allowed two of those brown trout. And this here is a, is a wild brown trout. Um, and what it looks like, it has uh, uh, nice golden fins. But private clubs exist on the rivers and they stock all kinds of trout. They stock big fish like this uh, Kamloops rainbow, or they stock tiger trout, or they stock um, brown trout. And people will ask, well, how, how can people own the river? How are these clubs private? Um, they lease or own both sides of the river. Uh, in fact, many of them have invested uh, a lot of money in terms of uh, stream re uh, remediation and, and stream restoration. Um, co companies have come in and actually uh, improved the thalweg and improved trout habitat. And when they do that, the macroinvertebrates come back. There are places on private clubs where there are hatches like you would never seen because they've removed all the silt. So that is how uh, private clubs operate. So be mindful too as you're fishing um, that you don't venture from public water, you know, onto a, pr a private club situation. Uh, and we'll go on there. Now for the table, uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong. You know, it may sound like I'm such a, a catch and release purist. I am not. I like to eat. Uh, we're locavore to the core. You know, the reducing our carbon footprint by harvesting our own wild fish and game to me is true living. It's living the land, harvesting my garden, and trout fall right into that uh, portfolio. Um, when you keep your trout, the law states that a person must keep their limit on one stringer or on one bucket. So if there are seven fish on the stringer, you can't say that one's uh, cousin Brucey's uh, and he's over there. He has to have his own stringer or own bucket. So there's our six trout limit. Cleaning them, a small trout in the nine to 12, 13 inch range is ideal for eating whole. Um, there's a way to do it and you can slice right up under the jaw. There's a little V that comes together under the point of the lower jaw. You'll slice the belly open, put your finger down the throat and remove all the entrails and everything all in one shot. So the belly's open, you make that slit under the jaw, Put your finger in, remove all the entrails. Everything comes out except for a black line of blood, which is along here on the spine of the trout. You'll need to take a blunt instrument. Uh, oftentimes it's my finger or a butter knife and kind of scrape that out. That'll have an off-putting taste. Um, our trout that we're stocking uh, are better eating than ever. A, a few years ago, they introduced some uh, flavor and color enhancers to the fish. Um, they're coloring up beautifully and they're tasting great. So um, also be mindful where you toss the offal. If you do this cleaning process down near the river or stream or pond, don't just throw the offal or the guts into the water um, for the next person to come down and find. For trout that are large, and I like to do this with fish over three or four pounds, is stake them just like a salmon. Salmon, With a sharp knife, I'll find the sections in between the vertebrae and I'll cut down through this. This happens to be a round valley rainbow that feeds on gamorous shrimp and it's the color of shrimp and it tastes like as good as shrimp. So um, with that steak, you can put it on the grill or you can poach it. Um, it's just a, an amazing dinner. Lastly, uh, one of my favorite ways to, to uh, cook nice trout during the spring is to smoke them. 
And these are trout that have been slow smoked on a charcoal fire, uh, cold smoked, the fire is off to the side, using apple wood. It takes between five to seven hours, but the skin peels right off and it's got a flavor unlike you've ever experienced. That about uh, concludes uh, my presentation for the evening. I just want to remind you to uh, pass it on. You know, take take a kid fishing, take a big kid fishing. Um, if it weren't for my brother and all those mentors and role models that took me along, uh, I wouldn't be here uh, talking about this today. And that this is this is my own daughter um, with the fly rod and uh, the video. It, it says. It's a rock star trout, Daddy, and that just made uh, just made my whole spring. That was last year, and I, I can't wait to take her again. I want to remind you too. Um, we'd love to see some of your great trout photos. So here's here's the website right here. NJDFW photos at dep.nj.gov, and there are some parameters, of course, for the size. You know, keep them between one and five megabytes, and in these formats. We'd love to see your photos. We've gotten uh, so many great photos already, and uh, we're really looking forward to getting out there April 1st and uh, hitting the trout waters. No fooling. With that, I'll conclude my presentation and uh, open it up. Um, Chris, we have a couple of questions. One is, what is your recommended fly rod for trout fishing in New Jersey? This comes from Nick Honachewski. Uh, for trout fishing in New Jersey, uh, on rivers, I assume Nick would mean rivers in the northern and central part of the state, um, a four to five weight rod with a four to five weight floating line, and the rod length would be between seven and a half to nine foot. Uh, another question that Nick asked is, if Private property is on both sides of the stream. Is it legal for me to wade in the river? It is not. It is not. The property owners uh, have rights to the middle of the river. Um, you're not even allowed to float through or touch the river bottom. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions from Nancy Malaga. I hope I pronounced that right. Nancy asked, does the reel normally come with the rod? And what's your recommendation? And this could be for fly rods or for spinning gear. Um, what's best for beginners? What's your recommendation? And should you buy them separately or buy the whole package at one shot? That's that's a great question, Nancy. Isn't that really a great, great one? question. Yeah. So spinning rods, uh, you'll often see in some of the lower end equi equipment, lower end rods, they'll be sold as a match set. They'll be sold a rod and reel with the line already on it. Uh, the line that comes on these that are sold as a match set is often of inferior quality. So I would remove the line and restring it with higher quality line. But there are some very good serviceable outfits that come together. When you start purchasing them separately, you have to worry about balance. The rod has to balance with the reel and that has to balance with the line, and that has to balance with the lure. So you'll need a little bit more expertise when buying them separately, and oftentimes when you buy them separately, you get a higher quality product that is going to cost you more at the front end, but it's going to last you longer on the back end, um, much, much higher quality. So great question, Nancy. So Tara Bogan asks, which flies do you love to have in your arsenal? Oh, there are several flies that I love to have in my arsenal, and my opening day crew would be remiss if I didn't call out what they refer to as a Lido special. Um, it is a, ready for this? This is a tongue twister. It is a bead head, gold ribbed hare's ear with a flash back. And that is one of uh, the Prince nymph, the ubiquitous Prince. Um, here's a mother minnow. A mother minnow is a great fly to have in my arsenal. Uh, one fly I can't be without is an Adam's dry fly. It imitates a lot of mayflies, uh, and those, uh, along with uh, prince nymph, pheasant tail, woolly bugger. A woolly bugger is a phenomenal streamer. It can be fished as a streamer. It can be fished as a nymph. And 
don't forget the squirmy worm that I showed. That's a little bit of a secret. The, the squirmy worm or the ham and eggs is, is a fly that we use a lot of times to coax strikes when other things aren't working. But uh, great question, Tara. And uh, she, she ha also happens to be a great fishing partner. Uh, next up is how do you release trout when they're brought up from the depths of Round Valley? That's a good question. There are, um, if you go on a t uh, the, the thermocline, so they'll, they'll actually get um, bent a little bit. There is some uh, barotrauma that lake trout can endure. And uh, you also, if you're gonna release a lake trout, you really have to take time because it's coming up from 80 feet to, to the surface and you'll see it expel bubbles as it's brought up. The main recommendation with that is to reel them up slowly and don't reel them to the surface or use a barotrauma tool. Um, NOAA has a lot of different barotrauma tools to lower them down. But if the water temperature is so great that um, it's 85 degrees on the surface and 50 degrees below the thermocline, and you catch a rainbow trout and reel it up through that warm water, um, it's, it's not gonna live. It's, uh, it, it experienced too much um, thermal shock and it's not gonna live. I've had days when, uh, unfortunately, I've had to release a trout that I know is gonna die because it's under the limit and have watched as a bald eagle flies down and picks that trout off the water surface. The eagles are trained over there to see those fish. So, but that is a good question and one that poses some challenges. How about, do you have any books you would recommend for further learning? Yeah, oh yes, McLean, uh, AJ McLean has a lot of great um, introductory books on trout fishing. He also wrote a fishing encyclopedia. It's about that thick. That's a great resource to have. I mean, anything fishing wise, you can look up in, in uh, McLean's standard encyclopedia. Um, God rest his soul, but Manny Luffglass uh, wrote a series of books. They're available still at a lot of tackle shops, um, encouraging people to get involved um, in fishing. Um, Matt Grobert has written uh, a great book uh, on hatches in New Jersey and uh, uh, has done a lot of work with that. Um, John Panola uh, has written a great book on trout fishing as well. So there are a lot of local authors. Um, also, uh, in terms of reading on, on the local scene, uh, you have magazines like the Fisherman Magazine uh, that have a report section and do a lot of articles on trout fishing. And also On the Water is a, a great resource. Um, the Black River Journal highlights trout fishing. Um, Trout Magazine, which you get when you subscribe to Trout Unlimited, has great information. So all of those are great resources, but uh, soak it up like a sponge. How about, um, next question is, can you recommend a good net for securing your catch? So, okay, for securing your catch. Hmm. So it's securing your catch indicates that you might be like keeping it and holding on to it. But I don't think that is, that's the question. I'm not sure. But um, a good net is that rubber coated release net that I showed in, in some of the slides. Um, Cortland makes one uh, very inexpensive. It's 30 or $40. Um, I paid $100 for my net. It's a, a name brand. So uh, in terms of a net, I think that's what that question was referring to. Um, the one I have on my back here is an inexpensive Portland one, which uh, unfortunately uh, got lost in the gorge. I, I ended up losing my net and buying a new one. So uh, I think that would answer your question. But in terms of securing your catch, I would use a stringer, a stringer, a uh, rope stringer or one with the metal clips to secure your catch in the water. Uh, do you have any recommendation for Tenkara fly fishing? That comes from James Armstrong. Oh, Tenkara is a wonderful sport. Um, and I've done some Tenkara fishing and long rods, short leaders. So with Tenkara, it's a Japanese form of fly fishing. It is very similar to nymphing. You're presenting the fly upstream and you're drifting it downstream. The only thing is, is the line is tied to the end of the long Tenkara rod and there's no reel. So what do you do if you have a giant fish? Well, in Tenkara, they let go of the rod. 
they let go. If the, the fish is going to break the line, they'll let go of the rod and try to retrieve it later. But um, in the Tenkara I've done, having too long of a leader ha has been um, the downfall. And having a leader that's about a foot or two shorter than the Tenkara rod, it has been ideal. So, but good luck with your Tenkara. It's a great, it, it, it's such a, a wonderful art form. In early spring, what lure do you recommend? In early spring, something that gives off a lot of flash, a lot of vibration, I would go with a MEPS or a Blue Fox or a, a Rapala. Okay. Uh, do you find that trout are more active during different times of day? Ooh, can we put the rabbit hole back up? So, <laughs> so during the early spring when it's really cold, actually in, in the winter, let's say I'm fishing in December and it's 32 degrees out, Trout are going to be most active during the middle of the day. Now, if it's getting hot and it's 70 degrees out, they'll be active in the morning and in the evening. So you really have to go through the seasons. Um, trout now in this early spring are going to be active from early morning uh, to mid morning. They might slack off a little bit, right? We all need a break to lie on the couch and relax before going to eat again. And then again in the evening, they'll start feeding. So um, there are those times, and uh, some people swear by looking at the salooner tables, you know, the moon phase, and, and some of the different publications will give you moon phase on when the peak fishing activity takes place. But um, in general, early morning and late in the evening, I like to get up early and fish until 1 o'clock, or I like to get to the river around uh, 6 p.m. and fish until dark. Um, some of the best hatches for fly fishing um, are in the dark. I have a headlamp on my hat. It's completely dark and I'm, I'm fishing blind and catching trout. That's when those big browns come out. Do you have any recommend recommendations for fly staple fly sizes? Yes. Uh, generally for nymphs, you're looking at size 18 to the largest fly I use uh, and I use flies that are a little bit bigger than some, but is a size 10. So number 18 to size 10 would be uh, fly size. Some of your larger streamers might get a little bit bigger than that. Some of your woolly buggers might be a four or a six or something. Mm -hmm. Good question. But uh, yeah, fly size, that little midge that I showed you was a 20. That's really on the small side, but 18 all the way up to size 10. Frank Schaefer asks, what is the best live bait for water of central New Jersey? We fish the Toms River in Jackson. So he's fishing moving water. Mm -hmm. And uh, the best live bait that I, that I would recommend is a juicy fat night crawler with a split shot, a couple of split <laughs> shots. And, and you know, and, and you know that you ever find those worms in the leaf pile that like jump like crazy? I, I call them Georgia jumpers, but there's got to be a better scientific name that I don't know. But sometimes you're, those worms, you put them on a hook and they go absolutely crazy. And those are, are phenomenal bait. But the toms, uh, definitely uh, night crawlers followed up by um, butter worms and mealworms. Second. Do you find the use of a bait caster to be practical for trout fishing? I do not at all. I do not at all. Um, there's not enough payload. There's not enough weight at the end of the line uh, for modern bait casting to revolve the spool properly. Okay. You will not get any distance. Are there any fly rod setups or brands to stay away from for a beginner? I don't think so. I do caution you, though, to stay away. Um, I have seen some of my clients show up with gear from Amazon that they bought sight unseen. Um, no offense to Amazon, they, they're wonderful, but I've seen some, some outfits that were of poor quality from them. Uh, if you go to a tackle shop and you buy local, you contribute to that sport fish restoration fund um, where your excise tax is going to, to uh, use for wildlife preservation and conservation. Um, you will get a, a better quality equipment and, and you won't have to stay away from any brands that they might sell you. 
Let's see. Sue asked, when you mentioned the South Branch, is it the South Branch of the Raritan? It is. There's a South Branch and the North Branch. Good question, Sue. Um, the South Branch uh, starts at Bud Lake and it winds down through Flanders and Long Valley and through the town of Califon, Clinton, Flemington, all the way through Neshanic and, and eventually um, meets up with the North Branch in, in Boundbrook and flows out to Raritan Bay as the main Raritan River. But there are different South Branches, the South Branch of the Rockaway or Matita Conk. So good question. The South Branch of the Raritan River is my home river and I am I'm extremely biased. I love that river. Do you have any suggestions for fishing landlocked salmon at Way Way on the Lake? Um, I do not, but uh, I, I, I'm not an expert on that. No, I, I would say I'm not an expert on landlocked salmon. Um, <laughs> I referred somebody to one of the tackle shops up there in Andover, and they talked to a young gentleman there. I believe his name was Garrett, and he uh, put them on some beautiful landlocks. So, um, Is that Andover Sport and Fish, Chris? It is. Yeah. Garrett, yeah. Garrett was able to help some friends of mine out and they caught some nice salmon. Great. Um, here's a question from Edward. He says, my wife and I recently retired and want to start fishing as it's something we can do together. What are your recommendations for getting started? Oh my gosh. Uh, absolutely. Um, I mentioned solitary, but there are times when it's just so happy to watch someone else catch the fish. Like, um, at this stage of my career, I'd rather watch someone else catch the fish. And uh, my fiance, Tara, has taken up fly fishing and she's really good at it. And um, I encourage you to go out together, um, purchase the equipment together or uh, talk to a reputable guide service. They're listed on our website. There's a list of guides and many of them will even rent you the equipment for the day to, to get out there and enjoy things together. But uh, there, there's, there's no better way to spend the time um, my fiance likes to geocache and I'll geocache and then go fishing and we'll go back to fishing or, or hiking. But, um, it is absolutely a wonderful, uh, thing for couples to do together. Let's see. Would you say that still water fishing is best to cast and wait or is cast and retrieve just as good? Hmm. They both have, they both have their points. Um, if it's really cold and the trout are sluggish, then a bait approach would work better. But let's say the fish are really aggressive and they're going after moving things and lures, then you would want to go with the lures. But let's say if, if we get a very extreme cold front on April 1st and it's been raining and it's you know, your fingers are getting a little numb, then the bait would tend to outproduce the lures. Uh, yes, let's see. Fruitful spots in Passaic County. I'd like to direct everybody to those places to fish that I posted in the chat there. Yeah. Like a, like a leopard, I have many spots, but I'm not willing to share them all. <laughs> What's up with the flavor enhanced trout that you mentioned? I've seen so, a lot of fly fishermen approach a pool from behind. What do you do if that's not an option? So that's a two part question, right? So yes. the, uh, the flavor enhancers were added to improve color. So it improves the color and in turn um, gives the flesh more appealing. Uh, it has more of, of a uh, uh, shrimp based diet than less of a, a vegetation or soy based diet. So um, it improves the flavor by changing the diet of the fish and it also makes them uh, achieve their natural color. So it's a transition to go from pellets in the hatchery to feeding on what they are supposed to feed on, which are macroinvertebrates, worms, um, annelids, and fish. And what what was the second question, Jess? Oh, it's approaching um, a pool from behind. Yeah, what do you do if that's not an option? I've seen a lot of videos on Euro nymph fishing and casting upstream and holding the line a little tighter. Correct, yeah, the, the presentation should be upstream. Um, sand, like Atlantic salmon fishermen will fish down and across and steelhead fishermen sometimes will fish down and across. Our trout fishing is done upstream. If that's not possible for you to get that angle upstream, then you need to improve your lie or change your lie and move uh, your location so that you can achieve that. Like 
45 degree angle presentation upstream. Um, I remember I was in the gorge once and I came wading down current uh, and someone was fishing and he says, aren't you supposed to wade just upstream? Well, walking upstream does uh, help you with stealth because if you think about it, you're walking in the river and you're kicking up rocks and debris and everything. So sometimes if you approach from above the fish, you can kick all that silt and sediment down into the pool and ruin it. So, but Euro nymphing is a great tactic. Uh, you're using a, a long leader, not, not using the fly line, but you're presenting a heavily weighted tungsten fly directly upstream and holding the rod high and letting it tick along the bottom, maintaining contact with the bottom as it drifts down. And instead of a indicator, like a float or a balsa float in um, Euro nymphing, you're using a cider, which is made of uh, fluorescent uh, material or brightly colored monofilament that you kind of watch for any kind of disturbance or pause. And if that cider straightens out or stops, then you set the hook. Um, with nymphing, I always tell my clients, hook sets are free. Uh, let's see. Great questions so far. Yeah, we've had really good questions. Um, my line keeps binding. Am I putting too much on my reel? That's from Justin. If you're putting too much on, it'll come luffing off the spool. If it's binding, then you don't have enough line. So you'll see the spool needs to be filled about to within about an eighth of an inch of the lip. Now, if you overfill a spinning reel, when you open the bale, it'll all come spilling out. But if you have uh, not enough line, it could bind up on you. And also, when you're spooling a spinning reel, you need to pay attention to the way this, the line is coming off of the spool that you're taking the line off of. Because if you do it in the wrong direction, you can put twist in the line. It has to be in the same direction that the bale, this rotary part, is turning. But if it's binding up, I think you have not enough line. How do you recommend discarding the entrails? I would take them into the, to the woods and you could leave them for the raccoon or you can uh, bring them in a bag at home and uh, bury them. But I just, I just don't like to see it when you get to a spot and there's like, I mean, it's like, it looks like a re really morbid situation. Do you have any recommendations for ice fishing trout tactics? That's again from Nick. Uh, ice fishing trout uh, can be very productive, especially uh, the Division of Fish and Wildlife does a, a, a winter stocking in November. And we use sonar to fish just under the ice to locate the, the trout and use a uh, one of the best trout lures that we've uh, had success with through the ice is a Hildebrandt flicker spinner with a mealworm on it. It's a little tiny little spinner with just a little bit of a mealworm on it. It's got flash. You put a little bait, but uh, yeah, that would be the best way to uh, target those trout and, and target them. Like I said, they're not going to be swimming right along the bottom like your pickerel, pike, and other fish will be. They're going to be from the middle of the water column up. Good question, Nick. There's another good one. When nothing is biting, when do you change location or change flies? I would... Uh, I would change change flies quite a few times. Um, I go to a location and I look at it. And when I talked about reading the water, it has all those things that I'm looking for. It has a deep foul leg. It has a, a great river channel. It has a cut bank. It has a deep pool. The fish are there. They might be so selective at that point that I have to really go through my arsenal and find out what they're going to hit. Um, my fly boxes are, are they, they has a million different flies. It's, it really is a rabbit hole. But uh, I would change tactics or change flies or change lures many, many times before I gave up on a spot that I had confidence in. Let's see. What's the best method to release a trout back into the river? Uh, great question. Leave it in the water. I use a pair of forceps. 
to reach down into my net and unhook it. I wet my hand. I reach under the belly of the trout. I face the trout upstream. Or if it's in a pond, I'll walk it out a little bit away from the bank you know, with my boots and, and get it into deeper water. Um, if the river is flowing into the fish's face, into the gills, I'll wait till I feel that trout start to kick away and let it swim off. Great question. Are There's a great, go ahead. great way to do it. Go ahead, Jess. Are artificial baits like power bait toxic to fish if ingested? No, they're not toxic. They, no, that, that, that would have uh, really have halted their sales. But no, they're not toxic. Um, the synthetic material uh, is very inert. And the, uh, the fish, fish uh, scents or the fish scent that's in it makes it appealing. But the, the material is inert. Um, even corn, trout can um, pass corn. I've seen people using corn and then trout um, pass it eventually. It's not easy. But what I have seen and they do not pass is hard cracked deer corn. I saw that at Round Valley, somebody chumming with deer corn and uh, trout cannot pass that hard deer corn. But uh, uh, f feel safe in using those products. Th those are safe for the fish. But do we have any recommendations for fishing the Delaware River? The main stem of the Delaware River holds some trout. But if you really want to have a great trout experience, you'll go up uh, to Roscoe and Hancock, New York and fish the east or west branch of the Delaware. Um, I have my weekend stay planned already for late spring and uh, you will learn a lot. Um, those are tailwater fisheries, uh, both the east and the west branch flow out of reservoirs. So they are clean and cold year round. When the south branch of the Raritan or the Muskie, my home waters is 72 degrees, I head up there. There's amazing hatches and those are all wild fish. They're very challenging. So a recommendation up there um, would be to uh, seek a reputable guide service. I know uh, uh, Cross Current and Joe D up there does a great job uh, guiding and teaching people the uh, upper Delaware. And uh, Tara and I went up there uh, this past spring with my friend Steve Lynn, and we caught some wonderful trout and had a, an awesome stay at one of the places up there. Um, in terms of the main stem of the Delaware, you will find an occasional trout, a holdover trout. It does tend to get a bit too warm. Uh, it's more conducive to stripers and shad and, and flathead catfish. Okay, here's a great question from Michael that I'm sure people are interested in knowing. Uh, say for April 1st, say at the Musconet Kong for a first timer in fly fishing, what fly would you rig first out of the list that you mentioned earlier? Mm. I, I know the answer. I mean, it's, it seems like I wouldn't, but I would, right now, the, the prince, the, the beadhead prince has been the best fly uh, for myself and for the opening day crew. I know uh, uh, Kelly and Big Irish has caught a big fish on a prince and Jerry and, and uh, JP, Winston. Oh, we've all hung some really big fish on opening day on a prince. So... Um, I would have that fly. Beadhead Prince. Here's another first timer question. Do you suggest a single fly or two on a rig? Uh, I like to give them a little bit of an option. So uh, that's a great question. I actually have it rigged here, if I can show you. Can you guys see me on the screen a little bit? But I can untangle this guy and uh, I have just kind of a weird attractor fly here. I'll probably get tangled in this later, but yes, I will tie to the back of the first fly. I tie a clinch knot to the bend of the hook and a smaller midge. This happens to be a size 18 uh, olive RS2. And here's a big bead head. So yes, I like to fish uh, two flies. Um, one, which would be a, a big macro invertebrate. And then on the back, oftentimes an emerger and trout will hit that emerger as the fly swings down river and starts to rise up. It's a great uh, tandem tactic and all the guides uh, that I know that, that work with me uh, utilize that. Great question. 
But it's a, a five turn clinch knot. It takes a little practice to tie the clinch knot in your hand, but once you get the hang of it, it's very easy. Let's see, do you find dark colors or light colors work better with the trout? In the early spring, the macro invertebrates and the mayflies are dark. As you go into summer, you start to get lighter varieties of uh, insects. Uh, so you'll get uh, Hendrickson's and stoneflies and things in the early part of the season. And then here come in, in mid spring to early summer, you'll see a lot of caddis and then sulfur mayflies. So in the early part of the season, I like darker colors. And then as uh, spring moves into early summer, I like lighter colors. Okay. Uh, is there a brand of waders that you like? Uh, I've tried them all and they all will leak. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I've tried them all. I've gotten like really expensive Sims waders and I've gotten inexpensive um, Orvis or, or Reddington. They, they've all have served their purpose, but um, there, there really isn't a brand that I prefer. Uh, just kind of stay away from uh, neoprene or those like heavy rubber ones and try to use the breathable material. It'll, it'll feel better. The rubber ones and the neoprene ones will cook you inside. Let's see. Um, do, do. Which fly tying vice could you recommend for a beginner? Ah, for a beginner? Uh, I got a great one, uh, inexpensive one uh, by Peak. Uh, Renzetti makes a, a, a great vice. Um, there, there are so many different ones out there. So, yep. Okay, yeah, Regal. Regal is a really good, I think it's Regal. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they make a really nice spring-loaded vice. And they're, they're not that expensive. I mean, they do have models like the Renzetti presentation vice with all the equipment and everything that'll cost a thousand dollars or you can get a basic one uh, for forty fifty dollars when i started fly tying i bought a kit for fifty dollars from one of the big box outdoor stores and it had everything i needed to get started including a, an inexpensive g vice okay do you have any recommendations for flies for still water uh yes uh, in still water, uh, you'll be uh, imitating uh, dragonflies or you'll be imitating subsurface. I, I would go with a woolly bugger as one of the best still water flies to use to cast out and retrieve. A zonker is a great fly. It has a long strip of rabbit hair and provides a lot of undulation. Um, and ponds will see uh, different hatches. So uh, small chronomids too, like our little... Tiny mosquito larvae will often be present in ponds, so they will often work too. And um, the muddler minnow. The muddler minnow can be fished under the water or it can be fished right along the surface. So the muddler minnow is a great one for fishing ponds. Great question. Uh, let's see. Any particular rapala lures that work well for catching trout with a spin cast rig? So I'm, I'm not sure of the model number. I, but it's a floating Rapala. It's the, like the smaller size. I think F5 and F7 is too big. It's the one under that. But it's just a, a smaller floating Rapala. It comes in a lot of different colors. Temperature affects fish activity. How about sunny versus overcast? Absolutely a great question. I should have, why didn't I think of that? That should have been in my presentation, but overcast days provide a lot of stealth. Uh, sunny days, while can be very good, if the water is low and clear and it's a bright sunny day, you have to pay attention to your shadow, where it's falling on the water, because everything that eats trout comes from above. Bears, otters, ospreys, everything. A trout is trained to look up if it sees a shadow or something above it, it's gone. So yes, absolutely. Um, overcast days provide amazing uh, fishing. You can get closer. You can be a little bit um, more aggressive with your techniques. Uh, the same can be said for when the water is slightly off color, but when the water is low and clear and it's a bright sunny day and you're fishing in the middle of the day, 
you're going to in for it, you're going to be in for it. You're kind of setting yourself up to, to have some tougher fishing. Okay. Here's a question for somebody that looks like they're kind of new to fly fishing. They ask, how much space do you realistically need to practice fly casting? Great question. Um, the maximum distance that I generally cast is about 15 or 20 feet. So 15 or 20 feet in front of you, 15 or 20 feet behind you. And there's a cast that we teach uh, in addition to the, the overhand cast, which goes like this. There's a cast where you can basically do it in a phone booth. It's called a roll cast and we do it all the time. You just leave the, the line and the lure and the fly laying right there. You drag it back, you flip it, you point the rod up high and you just roll it over. And you can do that in a phone booth and you need uh, uh, only a tiny space to do that. Um, I remember uh, Lefty Cray had a piece of string and he used to practice casting in his office. And he had a little tiny pencil with a string on it and he would practice his casting in the office. It, it was the same concept. So um, very little space. A park is great, but uh, just remember that if you're practicing fly casting on a hard surface, a fly line has a slick coating and you can ruin your fly line if you don't do it on grass. Hey, here's a good question for you. Do you have any recommendations of tackle shops in Central Jersey for fly rod setups? Central Jersey. Um, uh, I, I can recommend uh, a, a few. Uh, I know um, Bogan's Bait and Tackle. I know they have a, 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 a nice freshwater section. Um, Central Jersey. So let's see, I don't do a lot of tackle shop shopping in Central Jersey. So um, freshwater stores. Uh, yeah, I'd have to look on the, uh, I'd have to look on the light, like the, the li list of license agent page for Central Jersey. But I know um, Bogan's Bait and Tackle does freshwater. Jersey Hooker has some freshwater stuff. Um, he's really good. Um, other tackle shit. And that's that that would be my my two recommendations. I'm not really familiar with the the area in terms of commerce. So hopefully I'm not missing anybody and 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 if you uh, want I can maybe answer that question later. How long does it take for stock trout to acclimate to water once they are stocked? They're they're already acclimated to feeding on uh, on natural prey. I've seen uh, even right in front of the Pequest, there's a, a exhibit, like an exhibit, right, where the trout live and people can come and feed them and pet them. And I've seen hatches of insects in there and those trout going wild over these insects. Um, it takes them uh, only a day or two to really acclimate to what they're supposed to eat. So this idea of, well, I need a, a fly or a lure or a bait that looks just like a trout pellet. Is, is kind of a misnomer. So they, they acclimate instantly. It's ingrained in their DNA, their trout. You know, for that reason, um, brook trout will always love worms. And for that reason, rainbow trout will always eat eggs because they follow the salmon runs. And for that reason, brown trout will always eat minnows because they're pesivorous and they feed on other, other fish. So it's in, their, it's in their DNA. Okay. Would it be better to bob a night crawler or worm or sink it? I would say uh, in the early season to uh, sink it, pop it up off the bottom, or in a river, use as light a weight as possible and, and let that night crawler gently kind of tick downstream. But I also showed the uh, slip float rig, which is a great rig. Now, if you're fishing in a deep pond and it's eight or nine feet deep, um, you might be able to set the float at four feet. But if you try to set it anymore, you're not going to be able to cast. So that's where that slip float rig comes in. But for the most part, I like to be fishing on the bottom and, and popping that bait up with a, a piece of uh, power bait or marshmallow. And that's for still water. That's a great tactic. Try it. All right. Let's see. What is the ideal cubic feet per second for fishing the South Branch? Uh, 
Great question. I, I just answered this the other day. I'd say uh, 125 to 150. Great. How critical are waders? Can I still find fish without wading? Uh, you can, but it will impede your ability to get into proper position. Okay. I, I know, I, I, I know a, a good, a good friend, one of our TU uh, and former council member, August Goodmanson. He, he doesn't wear waders. He goes in when it's freezing, but he is from Iceland. But um, you, you can wade. You just will be very cold. And, and using an old pair of shoes or some some uh, uh, boots, but waders definitely will extend your day and make it easier to get into position to reach those trout. Uh, let's see. What is your favorite situation to use a classic dry fly? It's a it's the summer. It's the evening, and the uh, uh, the the sulfurs are coming off. Or the Isonychia, which are a big uh, slate gray mayfly, and that is that is when I'm using uh, a bamboo rod or a fiberglass rod. I like to use classic tackle and dry fly fish. So it would be probably early June during the sulfur hatch at about six thirty seven o'clock at night. Okay. How far do trout move after being stopped in a stream? Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Paul Arnold, asked that question today. Do, do, with all this rain, are they going to get washed from here to Timbuktu? And uh, the answer is no. They do move around. But when they find good habitat, a good uh, hole or a spot in the thalweg, they will hunker down and they will stay in that spot. Um, and when it gets to flood stage, there'll be back currents or they'll tuck behind a rock and they'll just have to work harder, but they do not get flushed away or uh, washed out to sea. So they will move around. They do have fins, but they're going to find that habitat. You know, the, some of that private club water doesn't have any fencing to keep the fish in. What keeps them there is the habitat and the bugs and the food. So if they have all of those things, they're not going anywhere. Thank you. Uh, James Velchek asks, do you use fly clips or tie your fly directly on the end of your tippet? Oh, hey, Jim. Um, I like to tie directly. Uh, the, fly, the fly clip, um, any kind of uh, extra hardware I try to do without. Plus, they're so small to, to get on and handle, I end up dropping them. So I, um, I tie directly. And I know, Jim, a lot of us use this. Uh, during our education programs is the uh, the magnifier. And this has revolutionized the way I fish. Uh, you can have that, you know, some people will wear the, the cheaters around their neck or the, the kind that have the magnet in the middle, but uh, I tie direct and I use a, a, a five or six turn clinch knot, simple clinch knot to uh, tie the fly to the business end. Okay, what colors of spinners work best uh, example, MEPs or rooster tails, and do certain colors work better at different times of the day? That's a good question. It is, and there's always that saying like silver works good on silver works good on overcast days, and copper works good on uh, sunny days. There's kind of one of those things. I might be reversing it, but um, when there's bright sunlight, I think uh, the silver tends to flash more and can actually overflash. So people will use copper. And then on overcast days, they would use uh, silver. That's the way I've always heard it. But uh, color does matter, uh, especially in terms of water clarity. Um, they say in bright colors during like uh, turbid water, if the river's really muddy, um, I might, might want to brighten something up. And or if the pond is kind of stained or tannic in South Jersey, I might want to use a brighter color. But fish also. Um, have a lateral line. That's just as equally important as their eyesight. So a lure that moves the water is often more important uh, in those situations than color. You know, something that sends off a vibration that the fish feel along their lateral line. Good question. Okay, Chris, we have time for one more question. And John asked, what do you do if you gut hook a fish before opening day? Yeah. You need to just clip it and release it. Uh, obviously, there's no retention. So 
Uh, retention of a trout um, prior to April 10th uh, is, is black and white. You know, it's, it's unfortunate. And that's why I encourage anglers to use lures, uh, to use flies, to pinch down the barbs of their hooks, to use those uh, release nets to wet their hands before they um, hold the trout. Uh, there's there's no need to really give a trout a lot of time to ingest a worm or a night crawl or something. Maybe the count of three and set the hook. Um, we use an English style hook at the pond. Uh, it tends to hook fish less than the sprout or carlisle or any other type. So an English style hook, it almost looks like a miniature fluke hook, uh, tends to hook fish better in the corner of the mouth than others. But if you do hook one deeply, and it's, it's bleeding, unfortunately, you're gonna have to release that prior to April 10th um, and, and an otter or a mink or something will, will eat it. So, but that all, all the better to uh, use conservation and, and use artificials and good safe release practices. All right, well, thank you, Chris. And thank you for everybody for joining us. I had a great time, I did.